research funded by the UK BBSRC Research Council, and it's a collaboration between the Universities of St Andrews, Leeds, Dundee and Edinburgh with the Purbright Group. And of course the Purbright Group is axiomatic to this whole research effort because these are the only guys in the UK that are licensed to actually handle the virus. But I should also acknowledge the contribution of Peter Simmons from Oxford, who's been helping us out hugely in terms of bioinformatic analyses and actually design of some of these recombinant genomes we've been making. So, Jonas Salt was mentioned, um, and I'm just using this, this uh, comparison between killed and live attenuated vaccines, a la poliovirus. So Jonas Salk developed his killed vaccine in 1955, but then there was a huge incident. I think it still remains the biggest problem that the US has ever had, the so-called Cutter incident. And that arose from incomplete formaldehyde inactivation of poliovirus. And there were people paralyzed and people died from, from that incident. A year later, Albert Sabin brought forth his live attenuated vaccines. So this unfortunate incident here led to a lot of effort to, to, to validate these live attenuated vaccines, which, as we know, are being used in the WHO eradication campaign. But in the 1980s, we were able to figure out what had actually gone on during that attenuation, <laughs> this classical attenuation process by, by, by um, Sabin. So we've got the, the one and the type three poliovirus. Type two, unfortunately, has been lost. But we can then map and find out how many mutations had actually occurred during this classical serial passage method of developing this live attenuated vaccine. And we know, of course, with type 3, this is the problem, is that there were a very modest number of mutations, only three coding changes, of which only two were present in P1, which is a major region of attenuation. So that's the kind of paradigm that one can level at live attenuated vaccines using, derived by this classical method. You've got a small number of key mutations which can back mutate to give you a virulent phenotype. Now, in light of the success of the, of the, of the poliovirus um, attenuated vaccines, there were a number of attempts, primarily driven by Perbright, to generate live attenuated vaccines again by serial passage in, in mainly BHK cells. And there are a couple of experiments done in East Africa and South Africa on these live attenuated vaccines, attenuated in mice, but unfortunately, when they were put into cattle, they caused disease. The classical problem with these small number of key mutations reverting back to virulence. So that got live attenuated vaccines a pretty bad press. And then accompanying that in the 1950s, these agents here were much more effective in, in, in activating the virus than was formaldehyde for polio. So we'd got a pretty uh, effective chemically inactivated killed virus preparation. But of course, the problem there with, with, the, with this method of making um, these vaccines is that, of course, you've got to have bulk growth, tens of thousands of liters of pathogenic virus, and there's biosecurity, these high biosecurity facilities adding to the cost of the vaccine. These viruses do not replicate within, these particles rather do not replicate within the vaccine recipient, so you basically get immune response, responses against only the structural proteins. And I think the one thing I'd like to stress is that this chemically inactivated vaccine strategy does not address the strategic problem of wild animal reservoirs of, of virus. However, one can make stable live attenuated vaccines. And this was work, in fact, the, the, the building uh, at Purbright, the Plowright building, is named after Sir Walter Plowright, who developed this vaccine here for Rinderpest. And again, in the 90s, at Purbright, they made a series of recombinants using uh, molecular biology and reverse genetics that Francois so elegantly int uh, introduced for me before. And they were able to say that in Rinderpest virus, there were a number of mutations in different genes throughout the whole genome that made this a genetically stable vaccine and, and a huge success leading to the eradication of Rinderpest. Now, 
I had a, quite a lengthy engagement with the UK government to get permission to make this thing here that we could use at St Andrews, which has not got a high disease security facility. So this is the genome of foot and mouth, and what we proposed to do was to delete the capsid protein regions and insert a green fluorescent protein. So the idea is, the plea that I made to the UK government was that this would be safe to handle under non-high containment facilities. <coughs> And the UK government, bless them, eventually gave us permission to do it. And if you could play the movie, Mr. DeMille. Great stuff. So here we've got BHK21 cells. Down here is the time post transfection so that's two hours, three hours, four hours. Can you see that, those green dots appearing? So those are our cells now supporting the replication of that genome. So we can count the number of green objects and we can quantify the green fluorescence. So we can monitor RNA replication without the problem of, 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 of having capsids formed. And you can see the change in morphology of the cells as well. So it's biosecure, we can quantify genome replication. We can assess, we can screen the degree of attenuation for candidate mutations. And then of course, as I said at the beginning, we have to interact with Perbright. This is the only place that can actually rescue virus. So we can, we can transport these replicons down into Perbright where they're converted into infectious copies um, by removing GFP, reinserting the capsid proteins, make the infectious copy, and then look to see what the phenotypes of these attenuated viruses are. Now, this is not technology that we invented. This goes back quite some time. Uh, the idea is, is it, the acronym here is SAVE, Synthetic Attenuated Virus Engineering, and the idea is to use synthetic biology to alter how the virus encodes its proteins. And the idea is that you, you're altering the codon usage, and all the mutations that you're introducing are synonymous. There's no coding changes in any of the virus proteins. It's exactly the same sequence. Now, this was initially attributed to changes in what's called codon pair bias. XXX, YYY codons, that there were pairings that biology in RNA viruses selected against. <coughs> and on the basis of that, um, Eckhart, whoops, Eckhart Women's Group took out a patent and formed a company to make <coughs> live attenuated vaccines. Now, we didn't believe it, and Peter Simmons at Oxford didn't believe that codon pair bias was at the, at the basis of this attenuation. According to our bioinformatic analyses, it was all to do with CPG and UPA dinucleotide frequencies. And my lab, in collaboration with Peter Simmons when he was at the Roslyn, we showed that the attenuation was not due to changes in codon pair bias. It was due to these elevations in CPG UPA dinucleotide frequencies. Now, what effect that has on the patent, I don't know, but it's not strengthening, that's for damn sure. So what is this? How, how does one go about doing this? Well, if you can think about two amino acids, proline and glycine, encoded by CC and then anything, and GG and then anything, that would be the natural sequence. We use synthetic biology to change this to CCC, GGG, and now we've created a CG, an extra CG dinucleotide. Prolimethionine, again, we can use synthetic biology to create a new UPA dinucleotide. So we're not changing any amino acid in any of the proteins. And of course, when you make these mutations, you might be potentially altering secondary RNA structures. That was uppermost in our mind. So we performed a whole series of control experiments to show that the attenuation that we're doing is not interfering with secondary RNA structures within the genome. Now, the work that, that Plum published was they made a whole series of 489 nucleotide, silent nucleotide substitutions in, in P1 region, and they showed that after seven passages, this was still genetically stable. And importantly, this A, uh, A22 P2 deopt elicits a strong adaptive immune res response in swine. So I think, you know, that was a, a seminal paper pointing the way forward to using this safe strategy to make new live attenuated vaccines for foot and mouth. So our strategy was somewhat different. Our idea was to actually confine the changes to this region within the non-structural replication proteins. And the idea was to create an attenuated replication backbone 
into which we could slot P1 from any, any virus, any, any strain that was appearing. And we've created these replicon systems for O1K, A12, and Asia 1. Interestingly, replicon RNA re replicates as quickly as vRNA, um, and currently, uh, the Perbright are converting a whole series of these replicons into infectious copies, plus the constructs they've made themselves. So we can then analyze the virus growth in tissue cultured cells and then ultimately animals. And of course, the trick here is to get the right balance between the level of attenuation, but you want growth in the animal recipient such that it forms a protective immune response, but also with morbidity. So you're lowering the morbidity of the disease to an acceptable level. But this molecular biological approach allows us to do that very, very straightforwardly. So what would be the utilities of these live attenuated vaccines? Well, as I realize it's a pretty big pill to swallow all around for the community, but perhaps one small sliver of that pill could be using these things to enhance biosecurity during kill vaccine production. And this is a couple of constructs that we made at Perbright, 178 silent mutations, 247 silent mutations, we can characterize these in our um, Incusite Zoom microscope that quantifies GFP fluorescence. BHK21 cells, there's no difference in any of the viruses at all. MDBKs, a little bit of attenuation. Porcine cells, a little bit less attenuation. But these viruses have been rescued down at Perbright. The, the, these attenuated viruses grow like wild type in BHK21 vaccine producing cell lines but they're strongly attenuated in BTY, primary bovine thyroid cells. But critically, that this attenuation can be reversed by this drug here, ruxotinolib, which is a JAK2, JAK2, JAK1 inhibitor. And in fact, it's been shown for IGIV that this ZAP zinc, zinc finger antiviral protein is the cellular receptor that's actually being able to count or estimate the density of CPG UPA dinucleotides within the RNA. So, it's, I think it's becoming clear that these attenuations are occurring through affecting the innate immune system of the cells. At Perbright, they've made a, another series of viruses, again, elevated CPG in this region of the genome. They're calling this CPB+. I beg your pardon, shown here. That's the region that they've elevated uh, CPG dinucleotides. They've made another virus here affecting sec potential secondary RNA structure in that region of the genome. And they've also made a construct with mutations within high fidelity <coughs> mutants too, so that the polymerase is much less error prone, prone during replication than wild type. These viruses have been rescued and characterized and characterized in primary bovine and immortalized cell lines. And what one can see, which is not just the case of foot and mouth, but for very many other viruses in which this strategy is being used, is that uh, they don't grow in, in primary cells, but they grow pretty well in immortalized cells. And many of these immortalized cell lines have lesions in their innate immune systems. And you can see the plaque assays here. But of course, the dream would be to actually use these things directly as live attenuated vaccines. And obviously, there are a number of issues. I hope. I've gone some way perhaps to persuading you that we can build in genetic stability. So we've got literally hundreds of attenuating mutations, each one of which only reduces fitness a little bit, but taken all together produce substantial attenuation. So I don't think genetic stability, which is one of the uh, sticking points with live attenuated vaccines, is an issue using this strategy. Using synthetic biology in combination with the reverse genetics technology, again, that Francois introduced, we can easily fine tune the level of attenuation to get the desired phenotype of the virus that we want. And as I said, we need to get this balance between morbidity, immune response, and protection. And of course, using live attenuated vaccines, because you're expressing all the non structural proteins as well, it's generally recognized you get a superior immune response from live attenuated rather than killed vaccines. We've made attenuated backbones for OA and Asia 1. But there's some very interesting questions that arise. Were these to see use in the field? Could you get cohort domesticated animal transmission? Could one animal 
receiving the vaccine, then vaccinate a cohort animal, and could one get transmission? Whoops, I beg your pardon. Could one get <coughs> transmission to wildlife animal reservoirs from vaccinated domestic animals? So reverse the flow of virus, as it were, from vaccinated domesticated animals into the wildlife animal reservoirs. So. I think what we need is a big dose of ambition in this field. And the ambition has to be leading to eradication. And the problem is, I think, with, with live, sorry, with killed vaccines, is that you're locking yourself into a strategy of living with the enemy. You're never going to tackle that strategic problem of wild animal reservoirs of disease. And I would say that save. Synthetic biology confers huge versatility in, in vaccine design, rapid response to new strains. It's applicable to all serotypes. Uh, and that obviously one would envisage routine vaccination with live attenuated viruses, not in Europe, probably not in North America, not in disease-free areas, but areas where the disease is already endemic. Indian subcontinent, China, Southeast Asia, etc. And Producing these type of vaccines would have an impact on biosecurity. You'd need less biosecurity, and that could lead to the production of cheaper vaccines. There was, on, in 2014, there was a leak of 45 litres of concentrated live polio virus into a river in Belgium. And the impact of that was zero. You're leaking out a live attenuated vaccine rather than the pathogenic virus that you need to make killed vaccines. So I'm trying to make an impassioned plea for you, people to entertain the notion that, that maybe live attenuated vaccines would have a place strategically in the future.